Tasmay Sri Guru Venama Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapitam Yain Bhutale Swayam Upa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pustaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvase Sasunyavari Pasyatyare Satarine Panchakalpata Rubis Jakri Pasindu Bhai Vachapatita Nam Pavani Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namahama Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadar Har Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vindu Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. Before I begin, I just want to mention uh, to uh, Mother Lavanya uh, to update the calendar for tomorrow for Gadadhar Pandit's appearance day, who's the scheduled topic and on Thursday it's the class with Charlotte the Charlotte devotees and uh, the uh, class is Srimad Bhagavatam fifth canto sixth chapter verse number three so that's for Thursday and tomorrow Tuesday there is uh part of the appearance day Today, I'll just speak freely on some philosophical points, yes, good uh, which, might be of, which might be of interest. Uh, his Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, has mentioned in his lectures, and this is a fact, there are four types of people in the world. We can put them in four different categories. The karmis. A karmi is one, the word karmi is kind of like a derogative terminology or not derogative, but somewhat dismissive of, a, of definition by saying anyone who, who performs activities to get results, material results, is a karmi. Karmi means one who brings karmic reactions by their actions. Of course, that's a wide category. That's one category. Those who live in order to enjoy this material world and try to satisfy their golden life by becoming successful materially. It's a karmi. Then you have a little better than that. It's called the jnanis. The jnanis are this different types of jnanis. One type of jnani is one who, uh, through philosophical speculation on the absolute truth and studying various scriptures, they come to the conclusion that the entire material world is a place of suffering. And the only, the only uh, recourse is to detach yourself from all my material activities and ultimately uh, meditate upon and become connected with the impersonal feature of the absolute truth known as Brahman. So they, um, they drill the respiration. In other words, they perform pranayama and various kinds of uh, asanas and speculations, philosophical speculations on the absolute truth. They may also do different types of pujas. They have a wide range of activities which are meant to bring them uh, outside or free from all connections with anything material and connect themselves with the spiritual essence of Brahman, which is the all pervasing spiritual energy that permeates the entire existence. It's the light coming from Krishna's body in which there are innumerable living entities situated in that light. 
And that light is Krishna's energy. Brahman is not so easy to describe. Srila Deva Goswami describes Brahman in his Bhagavat Sandarbha, where he gives a very detailed description of Brahman. And Brahman is basically free from any uh, material upadis or designations, but it has its own um, alankaras, or what we say, not alankaras, but uh, what's the word? Features. And th that feature is that it uh, is the feature of knowledge and the feature of eternity. It doesn't contain the feature of bliss or ecstasy because Brahman is only the, the preliminary stage in God realization. And then higher than that, in another category of living beings are the yogis. The yogis, they also perform various types of meditations and prayers and, and uh, uh, you know, asanas like that. But their goal is to realize the supreme and absolute truth as manifested in the heart of all living entities. Uh, they look for Paramatma realization or God within the heart of all living entities. And that becomes the form of meditation. Uh, both of these types of realizations on the absolute truth bring results up to a certain stage. The, the yogis also can experience knowledge and detachment and perform various kinds of spiritual activities. Um, they don't have an understanding, nor do they try to have an understanding of the personality of Godhead. This is another class of people, the yogis. So the yogis want material powers, the jnanis want liberation, the karmis want material happiness. So each of those three groups have a per particular desire to fulfill. Therefore, they are not without desire or they're not without personal desire. Materialists, the karmis, their desires all center around family and acquisition of various types of material amenities and success within the realms of material existence within power, position, relationships. Uh, the jnanis, they want to free themselves from the suffering of material energy and just uh, meditate on, on the Brahman of Fulgence. The yogis, through their various types of austerities, they become materially powerful and they want to control the material energy. And so what they do, they also perform various types of activities such as becoming smaller than the smallest, greater, larger than the largest. Um, they can perform uh, various types of mystic. They're, they're mostly many of them who have achieved per perfection in the process of yoga are mystic yogis and they can transform themselves from one place to another simply by meditation. Prabhupada says the yogis would bathe in one place in the Jamuna, in uh, say in uh, Vrindavan, and they would come up uh, in the Jamuna in somewhere in a thousand miles away, or the Ganga. In other words, they they dip themselves in a holy river and then they come up in another place in another holy river where it's just a thousand miles from where they started. So they can defy time, time space, uh, measurement, material measurements like that. And Krishna explains in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the, the 18 forms of mystic yoga and uh, 10, 10 secondary, eight primary, 
Uh, and Man Prabhupada mentions a lot about the, the primary ones. You see, even those people who in the material sense who are born in Western countries, they also have some kind of mystic power where they can do some kind of magic. Uh, there was that one famous Harry Houdini. He could, you put him in a, you know, a very a box, a wooden box, and you lock it and you tie it with chains, and you can throw it into the ocean, and he'll come out with no problem. <laughs> or they can transform themselves one place to another. The the real powerful yogis they can uh, chant mantras. And they can move things, in, inanimate things, by the power of their mantras. They can move themselves by the power of their mantra. They can just insert mantras into a chair. The chair will fly in the air with them sitting on it. So, and sometimes when they have these cartoons about people flying on carpets, well, it's not some imagination. It, it's it's been it's done. So this is all playing with the material energy, trying to defy the material energy, become powerful, become, and then they present themselves as great gurus and they have their followers and they teach them, you know, how to gain some mystic power. And they usually take all their money. <laughs> That's what usually happens. And they willingly give their money to these gurus who become very materially wealthy, and then they live very nice, nice lives <laughs> because they can't get anything out of this material power. It doesn't give you satisfaction. It just builds up the false ego. So these are the three categories of personalities. There's the, but then there's the fourth, and that is the bhaktas or the devotees. The bhaktas don't want anything but service to the Lord. They are in the highest category. They have no personal desire. They only want to serve the Lord and please the Lord by their service. And therefore, they are niskinchina, or without anything material, no material desires. Where the other three groups, although they may present themselves in some kind of quasi-spiritual presentation, they still have personal motivations. A devotee who enters Krishna consciousness may also have material desires, but the process of Krishna consciousness is to, to transform those desires into spiritual desires and then use those desires that are based on the activities that one performs and then use them in the service of the Lord. And uh, that is the highest form because there is no personal motivation, just we want to please the Lord. <laughs> and that is bhakti. So the karmis, they suffer, they get misery. The jnanis, they get, they understand that they're eternal, they're not this body. They come to the sat feature. The yogis come to the part of the uh, chit feature, they develop knowledge. And, uh, but the devotees come Satchit and other, they actually come to the platform of Ananda. Ananda means in connection with the source of everything, Sri Krishna, who is Rasa Vaisai. He is the source of all spiritual happiness found within him. So one who comes in contact with Krishna, and becomes Krishna conscious to whatever degree they have, they become Krishna conscious. They experience this natural happiness that comes by way of serving the Lord. So that's the devotees. The devotees are different. They don't have any personal, nothing to gain. The devotees will be eager to serve the Lord in whatever situation they find themselves in. And if the Lord dictates to them and through any agency, such as the spiritual master, the scriptures, they're happy to take up service to the Lord because they know that pleasing the Lord, this is the highest expression of love. So the jnanis don't get love, they get liberation. Prabhupada talks about that liberation as not, it's not a, it's not a very happy thing because they're there alone. 
They have no association. And happiness bases based on relationship. The yogis, they become proud of their material powers and ultimately uh, they, uh, they don't, they, the false ego doesn't give them happiness. But the devotees, they're happy simply by chanting Hare Krishna and preaching Krishna consciousness, doing some service to the Lord, no matter how apparent, insignificant, cleaning the temple, washing uh, the, 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 the deity paraphernalia, cooking for the Lord, fixing the Lord's temple, whatever they can do, there's, that is their happiness. So that is where the devotees are superior in all respects because they have no personal motivation. And you, you might say, well, these yogis and these jnanis, they have powers where the devotees don't. Um, but that's just apparent. The devotees also have the powers that the yogis and the jnanis have, but they don't use them. If they have to, they can use them because Krishna is Yogeshwara. He's the master of all mystic power. So one who's connected with Krishna also gets the, the vibhutis, the powers of Krishna. And therefore, if the devotees need it, they will exhibit certain extraordinary powers that are even beyond the materialists can possibly. But the devotees don't try for these powers, but they are available when, if they need them in connection with their service to Krishna. Um, the devotees are very, very powerful. Um, Srila Prabhupada exhibited one such uh, demonstration of power. Srila Prabhupada was very small. He was not very, I mean, he was maybe five feet, two inches high, but still he was a, a gigantic personality in the sense that wherever he was, his, his person, his presence was strongly felt. One time there was a, the devotees were building an altar to perform a sacrifice. So they had gotten these big, big columns to place on the side of the altar. They had Lord Jagannath on the altar and they had placed this big, huge beam on the top as the connecting beam between the two sides which uh, sat high, not high above, but above Lord Jagannath. Uh, Prabhupada was sitting in the front waiting for the program to start. But then Prabhupada noticed it, nobody else noticed it. The top beam started to, be, started to give way and it was, was about to fall. The beam was really heavy. It took two men to carry it in, two, two strong men. So Prabhupada immediately jumped up from his seat and with his arms over his head, he grabbed the beam from falling onto the deities and held it by himself. Finally, some devotees came along and helped him. But Prabhupada exhibited this extraordinary power, which was, you know, a great amount of strength was needed to do that. But Prabhupada did it so naturally, because being connected with Krishna, Krishna is the source of all power. Krishna is the source of all opulence. Krishna is the source of everything. That's why devotees are the six opulence. The devotees have all wealth. We have all fame. We have all beauty, all strength, all knowledge, all renunciation. Everything is there with the devotees because all these qualities exist in Krishna in full. And devotional service means connecting with Krishna. So as we connect with Krishna, we, we can exhibit these qualities at different times. And so the devotees don't try for these qualities separately like the non-devotees do, or even the yogis and jnanis, but they know their connection with Krishna means they have all these powers available anytime they need them. 
but Krishna will only give it when you need it, not if you want to show off and show your your abilities, Krishna will not allow that to happen, so it will work. But if it's needed for devotional service or if there's some emergency like that, uh, devotees can exhibit extraordinary amounts of power like that. Not only physical strength, but intelligence, ability, uh, so many good qualities can manifest simply by the devotees, the devotees can man will manifest in relationship to Krishna. So that is Krishna consciousness. So we don't have to cultivate all these powers separately. They come along with the process of bhakti. So the devotees are simply interested in serving the Lord because service is the natural constitutional position of the living being. Jivar Surupoy. Krishna and Nityadas, all living entities are parts and parcels or intimately connected eternally, not only intimately, but eternally intimately connected with Krishna in devotion. In fact, we are always connected with Krishna, even if they were not connected in devotion, we're still connected with Krishna because Krishna is the mula, he's the root of everything. So everything is connected to him and being his part and parcel, we remain connected. The persons who are not aware of the connection is simply due to their, their, their turning their attention away from Krishna. But the connection is always there. And Prabhupada would give the example of the rich boy who leaves home and goes wandering around the world and lives like a vagabond, simply living from day to day. He gives up his rich family. He gives up his comforts at home. And he just starts wandering. Sometimes he suffers because of the, the difficulties he encounters while traveling. A lot of times he may not even have enough finances to keep himself together. But still, his father is there, his home is there. All he has to do is go back and everything is available for him. So the connection remains, although the activities may be different. But once the activity uh, is uh, directed towards Krishna, then the connection is awakened in terms of we remember, oh yes, Krishna, I am eternally connected to Krishna and devotion. So that's Krishna consciousness. So these are some points. These are the four groups, the jnanis, the karmis, the jnanis, the yogis, and the bhaktas. Karmis, Gyanis, and Yogis each have personal interest and motivations. The devotees want to simply please the Lord. That's all. And that's the difference between the devotees and all other groups of living entities. If we haven't come to that consciousness yet, then that is our, our focus, how to come to that consciousness of wanting to please Krishna in all activities we perform. And that, that's understood by following carefully the instructions of the spiritual master and along with the prescribed sadhana that is given to us. And of course, Srila Prabhupada has given many general instructions such as read his books, chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra for Grihastas, worship the deities, for Grihastas, distribute prasadam to living entities on a daily basis. Um, for brahmacharis to study the scriptures, know the scriptures and be able to speak. Uh, for the vanaprastas to uh, perform devotional service to, in a detached way from all of their material previous arrangements and go to holy places and serve the Lord there. And for the sannyasis is to travel and preach, which right now it becomes a difficult thing because traveling is not so easy. It's, it's restricted in many areas, but we perceive that that will also change in due course of time. Okay, so these are these are the four groups and. Uh, 
a little bit about their activities and their motivations. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. It was really good to know, you know, different types of people and uh, who should we strive to be and uh, what are the best, you know, uh, good and bad things about them. So devotees, if you have any questions, uh, any comments, realizations, please uh, unmute yourself and you can ask. Thank you. Or you can chat it, uh, type in the chat box. Thank you. And one thing I'd like to mention is Prabhupada mentions that devotees who are engaged in devotional service who are not pure, they may be categorized as karma mishra bhaktas, jnana mishra bhaktas, and yoga mishra bhaktas. That means bhakti mixed with karma, bhakti mixed with jnana, bhakti mixed with yoga. yoga. So um, we also can see ourselves, that are we mixed according to the desires of the, any of these three other groups? Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada, all glory to you, Maharaj. Oh, thank Krishna. you for Hare Krishna. Thank you for this uh, nice explanation of the different transcendentalists and the bhakti yogas. Maharaj, I have two questions. Um, the first one is the the Brahmavadis and the Mayavadis are they are different, right, Maharaj? Um, yeah, a Brahmavadi believes that Brahman is supreme, and the Mayavadis believe that everything is Maya. <laughs> uh, what is that thing? Uh, Vama Satya Jagat Mitya. That uh, Brahman is truth and Jagat material, the material world is Mitya or false. That's the Mayavadis. The Brahmavadis, they're not, generally the Mayavadis are envious. But the Brahmavadis, real Brahmavadis, they just think Brahman realization is the highest. An example is the four Kumaras who were Brahmavadis. When they come and came in contact with the lotus feet of the Lord, uh, especially the Tulsi leaves mixed with the sandalwood paste that was used to that was used to worship the Lord, they changed from Brahmavadis to Bhaktas. But the Mayavadis won't. They remain defiant of the absolute truth. And generally, they, their, their whole idea is that, uh, that uh, the living entity, uh, they actually say, what is that? Uh, 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 Soham. Soham, I am that. So the I am that means I am that which is the supreme. <laughs> and therefore they think that the living entity is God, but he's fallen into the material energy. Therefore he needs a process to reawaken his consciousness to understand his position as being the supreme. So they think all living entities are supreme, but they have forgotten. Thank you, Maharaj. And the destination of the Brahmavadis is the, the Brahma Jyotir. Yeah. And what about the Mayavadis? Mayavadis, <laughs> Aruna Krishna Pradam Pradam Padantiyadan Nuskure Ahangraya. They may go up a little bit on the spiritual platform, but they fall down because they have, they reject the Supreme Lord. And then they come back into the material world. And you'll see, if you know actually any Maya bodies, they're doing some welfare activities or they're doing some, some uh, philanthropic activities in the material world. 
they talk about the whole material world is false, but then they wind up taking up material activities anyway, <laughs> because they don't accept spiritual activities. Or they don't say accept devotional activities. They may also, Maya bodies may also chant Hare Krishna and worship the deity. But they think the chanting of the Hare Krishna will lead you to the unmanifested aspect of the Lord. So the chanting is a means to get somewhere. The worship of the deity is the same. The deity is simply material. It's made out of material elements, but you need form in order for worship. Therefore, they accept deities for worship, but only to have visual form so you can go beyond the form. So the form is there to go beyond the form into the formless because they say that form is limited and formless is, uh, is unlimited and therefore the supreme is unlimited. <laughs> but we say the forms are actually spiritual in itself and Krishna's form is Krishna. The deity's form is not different than the Lord. But they, they, they see because they have all, their conception that all forms are material and spiritual mean, must mean without form. Therefore, spiritual is formless and material is form, has form. But they have no understanding of material, of spiritual forms. So they also, uh, just to for, for my clarification, Maharaj. So the Mayavadis also would end up in the Brahma Jyotir, but they fall down. Yeah, they can because they perform austerities and penances, if they follow scriptural injunctions. But generally, they always take up some kind of material activities after, after some time. They'll chant, they'll do some worship, they'll do some prayer, they'll do something. But they, uh, they sometimes they say, they address to each other, Om Namo Narayan. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's Narayan. The dog is Narayan. <laughs> the cat is Narayan. The garbage man is Narayan. Everybody's Narayan. It's a it's a it's a philosophy that's not really a philosophy. It's just it's put together by Sankaracharya who said, said, you know, that everything ultimately material is false and spiritual is own real. And because you are spiritual, you are that real one. So they take the, they don't have the understanding of duality. They sit, they are monists mostly. Everything is one. There's no difference between anything. So sometimes we would run into Mayavadis, just like one time at one at the Kumbha Mela one time. We were, one devotee was uh, with one Mayavadi and you know, it's cold, it was January. So sleeping in the evening was, was quite cold. So one Mayavadi, he had a blanket. So the devotee said, well, if everything is one, you know, whether you have the blanket or I have the blanket, it doesn't matter. So why don't you just give me the blanket? Because <laughs> it's all one. And just to prove his philosophy, he gave the blanket, but that, that whole night he was freezing. <laughs> Thank you, Mahal. Like yeah, so they, you, they don't have any real philosophy. And they're envious of the Supreme. They want to become the Supreme. They worship the Guru as the Supreme. And then when they become the Guru, then they throw the Guru away. <laughs> For instance, uh, they have the philosophy that uh, a ladder is useful because you can you can use it to climb up onto the roof. But once you get onto the roof, you don't need the ladder anymore. So therefore, 
you, you use the guru to become the guru yourself and then you can get rid of your guru. So yeah, they... Uh, And they're very expert at speaking nice jugglery of words. If you hear their philosophy, it, it may actually sound very interesting, but it's, it's just they're, they have this ability to speak convincingly about something that is not correct. <laughs> That's why, you know, Lord Chaitanya said, Mayavadi Krishna Aparadi. Mayavadis are offended to Krishna. Anyone, he said, anyone who hears Mayavadi philosophy is doomed. Unless you are fixed in Krishna consciousness, you can be easily, the neophyte devotees may also be led away by Mayavadi, Mayavadi speaking philosophy. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah, but the Brahma bodies, they're, we, we welcome the Brahma bodies because they're not envious. They just think Brahman is the highest. That's all. Maharaj, just one on question on this one. Sorry. Uh, I mean, we know many institutions and many gurus and who are Mayavadis, but do we know who can be called in the current day and age? Uh, 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 Brahmavadis, non envious, but they believe that God is impersonal. Well, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between the two. You really mm -hmm. have to spend some time and learn what is the nature of their worship. But the Brahmavadis don't say they're supreme. They say that, you know, we are all, we are Jiva, we are worshiping the, the supreme who has manifested himself as Brahman. But their, uh, their, their attainment to Brahman realization is also temporary. Because as long as there is no Ananda, you have to come back to material activities to find some kind of Ananda. Prabhupada well, gives the example. If I tell you, you can go into this field and stay there by yourself eternally. Is that happiness? <laughs> In other words, there's nobody to bother you. You will have no material miseries, but you're all alone, that's all. <laughs> and you can stay there eternally. Well, you would think, I wanna share with somebody. <laughs> so that's the nature of the soul. The soul is looking, it needs connection with another soul. But because they're envious and they want to, they're interested in power, and, and some kind of position. And, you know, because their philosophy is not correct, it, they fall down again to the material realm. And you'll see a lot of these yogis, they have their bookstores, they have their health remedy programs, they open up Ayurvedic hospitals, they do all kinds of things um, for material welfare work. And the Gali and the uh, Brahma bodies, they're pretty much the same, except they're not envious. If they hear something higher and recognize it, they will change and become devotees. But the Maya bodies won't. I know, I said I had a lot of association with Maya bodies. <laughs> I went to one conference, they asked me to be a representative of this con. Back in 1999, the, uh, you know, what is it, BHP? You heard of BHP, right? Let's see. That uh, that Hindu party. Oh, that's the VHP, Vishwa Hindu. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, they, yeah, well, we had some connection with them. So they asked us, send one of your representatives to this. And it was all Maya bodies there. So I had to spend like four days with these myobodies. 
it was really miserable. But, and I have a picture of me and all of my bodies together. I'll show it to you sometime. <laughs> but they let me speak. And I spoke on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> I spoke on Lord Chaitanya's practice of Krishna consciousness. But this, this was in, uh, this was in, uh, uh, where was it? Uh, what is the name of that? It's one of the bigger, Austin, Texas. It was in Texas, Austin, Texas. But there's a big, there is a uh, big Mayavadi place called, uh, what is it? New, uh, uh, what's Rada, where's, what's Radharani's place called? Varsana. Varsana? Yeah, 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 New Varsana. That was the name of the place, New Varsana. So they pick up names like that and they just put it, yeah, New, New, New Varsana. And they had, they had different kinds of deities there and everything. But when I would listen to them speak, you know, I get completely bewildered. What <laughs> can't figure out what they're talking about. But I didn't find them very, I found them very arrogant, most of them. And they had this thing, he was carrying this arrogance about them. Because they're not, they're not experiencing happiness. They just, they have some knowledge, that's all. And they're proud of their knowledge. Thank you, my Lord. Hare. Hare. Be careful, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada. We have so many sadhus. And this was in India. This man was from India, probably was in India. Probably he said, we have so many sadhus. Yeah, we have so many problems. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, that's your problem. You don't know who is sadhu. You don't know who is a real sadhu. <laughs> Anybody who comes along, they have, they develop a little mystic power or they can speak very convincingly. People follow. Most <laughs> people don't know. This guy, this this person now, what is it? Sadguru. He's a big guy now in India. Mm. He has a big following. He's a he's yeah. a he's practically an atheist. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Sadguru? Yes, yes, he's very popular, Maharaj, with a lot of celebrities, and he rides bikes, and he's a very, he's a, he, he's a really a publicity man, and he's really... Yeah, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a show guy, and two, yeah. of our devo, two of our devotees, who were quite wealthy, um, do you know, let me see, you know the Hindujas? You heard of the Hindujas? Yeah, it's a very rich family. So in London, there's the Hindu family comes to our temple in uh, Soho Street in London. So I see them when I when I go there in the morning. They come. So these two brothers, there's four brothers I think in the main family. So they went to this Sadguru, and they were there, and they got a chance to ask him a question, and they they asked him about R Rama and Krishna being the supreme. And he said, no, this is all some mythological. This, this Rama and Krishna don't, it doesn't exist. It's just some mythology. That was his response. So he, he's pretty much, he claims to be a what, a Shivite or something. <laughs> Is he a Shivite or something? He claims to follow Shiva or something? Yes, he claims. He claims all kinds of things, Maharaj. He claims to be a political expert. He claims an Ayurvedic expert, depending on what's what's hot in the market. And <laughs> then he also builds large Shiva statues and 
he has his own definition of Shiva as well. So that's quite. Yeah, he's a he's a charlatan. <laughs> we're not afraid to say yeah. that because, you know, if unless we 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 expose people to the to these people, they get cheated. You know. <laughs> but a devotee who has knowledge of Prabhupada <clears throat> can defeat him easily. But they don't accept defeat. He's easily defeatable. But he won't deal with devotees, you know. Just like this, there was one famous uh, Muslim who was trained in India also. I forgot, he's like the leader of all the Muslims, real scholar. Zakir Hussein. Zakir Hussein, he does a lot of debate. Yeah. He's a debater. He de defeats everybody. Yes. Yeah. So we uh, we challenged him. Uh, one of our devotees, who was Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, said he wanted to debate with him. So he said, "Well, I don't debate with anybody who has any any less than ten thousand followers." <laughs> so that was his excuse. Then finally, he did accept the debate with Bhakti Purusha Maharaj from Mayapur, disciple of Jayabhattaka Maharaj. And so they arranged for some debate. And it was about to start, but then a, a torrential rainstorm came and it just washed the whole thing out. This was in India, so it never happened. But they did start to say something. And he knows he knows the Vedas also. This this Muslim, he was, and uh, when we explain the importance of Bhagavad Gita, he said Bhagavad Gita is Smriti, and Smriti is not is uh, you know the truth of the Vedas is found in the Shrutis, not the Smritis. But he wasn't he wasn't aware that the Smritis are actually commentaries on the Shrutis. Well, for people to understand, because people cannot understand the Shrutis. We need the Shmitis. So Bhagavad Gita is Shmiti. It's Arjuna is milking Krishna, and Arjuna is the calf, Krishna is the, uh, is the cow, and he's bringing them. That's why Gita is called Gita Upanishads. Gita Upanishads. So, you know, there's nobody can defeat us. But people won't debate us because they say we're too fanatical. <laughs> Shiva Ram Maharaj also defeated one very staunch Mayavadi one time, simply by explaining Sankaracharya's statements in regard to Krishna. Bajagovinda, Bajagovinda, Bajagovinda Mudamate. <laughs> he told his followers, and and then you know. Shankaracharya is actually an incarnation of uh, Lord Shiva, who appeared just to get people away from atheism as propounded by the Buddhist philosophy. So there's a progression of knowledge coming in historical development from Buddha to Sankaracharya to Ramanujacharya to Madhvacharya to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which gives the highest philosophical teaching, which is a Chintya Beta Beta Tattva. But the absolute truth is simultaneously one with everything and different from everything at the same time. You know, Buddhism says there's no God. Sankaracharya says everything is one. And uh, Vishishta Dvaita comes from Ramanujacharya, which has a little different philosophy based on the living entity's relationship. Madhvacharya is a lot closer. <clears throat> he's dual. He, he's also in the category of bhakta, but there is also, they worship the supreme <clears throat> in Aishwarya and not in Madhurya. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the highest. So it's good to know these different philo philosophical teachers, teachings and teachers, so you can discern the different levels of philosophical and spiritual knowledge 
in relationship to the highest, which is, you know, as Krishna says, Bhakti Mama Vijananti. So worshiping Krishna in devotion with knowledge is the highest platform of spiritual existence. And the highest platform within that category is the is the, the residence of Vrindavan. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Is there any other question? Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada or glories to your holiness. Uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for explaining about these four types of transcendentalists. My question is, where are these uh, karmis? Three, karmis? Three, three types of transcendentalists. Three types, I'm sorry. Karmis, Gyanis, and Yogis, and then we have the Bhaktas, the devotees. Um, no, you have you have jnanis, yogis, and bhaktas that are transcendentalists. The karmis are not. Okay. So where are these jnanis and yogis? Are they mostly in the Indian uh, subcontinent? Well, it's not so clearly defined in Western worlds, but they're there also. The values and the lifestyles that people perpetrate have indications of all of these teachings and practices. So it's mixed up. In the West, it's not so distinct. And, but basically in the West, people are mostly karmis. But there are jnanis also. There are yogis. There are bhaktas in the Western realms too. But all this knowledge originated from India. So that's the origin of all of it, which is coming all from the Vedas. So it's clearly, it's clearly defined in practice. So you don't find, and nowadays in Western countries, people are not defined in these categories exclusively. They just mixed everything in. They mix a little karma with a little bhakti, with a little gyan and try to do a little yoga in there. So it's all mishmash. <laughs> it's like, yata mata tata pata. That is so true, Guru Maharaj. It's very confusing. So would you say that in the Western world, the majority are karmis and then those who are trying to practice some form of spirituality would be a mix up of all these different varieties? Yeah. And then wh where would we put uh, the major world religions like Christianity, Islam, Judaism? What category would that come under? Simple bhakti. Bhakti in a very simplified form. Hmm. If you're talking about pure Christianity, pure Islam, yeah, in a more simplified form. Okay. But nowadays, all of these religions, they mix in material terms and, and material activities. Okay. Thank you. Generally. There are, there are, there are strong, staunch Christians. There are staunch, uh, in practices of Elam, there are staunch practices of Judaism who are very fixed in their own practice, know their own scriptures quite well, and are exemplary. But a lot of the followers of these, of these different groups are not like that. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so Mataji, uh, go ahead, you can ask a question. Yeah, thank you, Mataji. Um, 
Yeah. Hare Krishna, uh, Dhanat Pranam, uh, Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question um, about the yoga ladder. Uh, thank you for explaining uh, the three different kinds of transcendentalist, Maharaj. So Maharaj, I still have like a little bit um, confusion. I'm still learning. Forgive me if I couldn't phrase the question properly. Uh, so Maharaj, in the yoga ladder uh, to reach the Supreme Lord, uh, yog yogis are categorized um, like higher than a jnanis. So why Maharaj? Because you have mentioned like um, yogis, uh, they meditate um, to get a material power and they tr try to control the material power. But jnanis, they have that understanding that we are eternal, we are not this body, and they meditate on the effulgence, that is like um, effulgence of the Supreme. So, but still, like, uh, why in the ladder, like... Uh, the, yogis because... may also, the yogis may also understand they're not this body, but they want yogic powers. <laughs> And their powers they use to, uh, to, to gather followers or to gather some material prestige or mm -hmm. to gather some material benefits. They, have, they also know they're not this body. Many of the yogis do. Mm -hmm. But they're interested in control, power. Mm -hmm. Generally, because if you perform yoga, you can become powerful. If you, but it, the, the discipline is very hard to follow. And therefore, you don't find any real strong yogis nowadays. If you really want to meet the yogis, you go to the Kumbha Melas. When the Kumbha Mela comes, the, all these yogis, they come out of the Himalayas. They come out of the forests. They come out of their caves. And some of these yogis are really powerful materially. They can do all kinds of things. Um, you know, sometimes there was one yogi, he came to Kumbh Mela, he was 250 years old. So they live, some of them live 300, 400, 500 years. You don't see them. They stay in their caves, they stay in their mountain places. Mm -hmm. So they also know they're not this body, but because they don't worship the Supreme as the principle of their activity, they take to manipulating the material energy as their means for, you know, gaining some recognition, some power or something. They're also infatuated by their own powers. There are many powerful yogis, and there's yogis who are less powerful. Okay. There's different kinds. So on the yoga ladder, yeah, they may be a little bit higher than the than the jnanis because they uh, they have an understanding that uh, there's the Lord is situated in the heart of all living entity. I forgot what the Sanskrit technology is something guyam, some pretty good guyam or something. I forgot what the word is, but it refers to Paramatma realization. If you uh, study the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, you'll see the yoga ladder as it's, as it's uh, explained by Krishna himself. But then he ends at the, the very last verse, Yoginam Apisarvesham Madgatendra Natmanaha Stradavan Bajate Yomam Teme Yukta Tamovataha. Krishna says, Of all yogis, he who abides in me, worship me in great and transcendental faith, is most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. So Krishna concludes with the bhakti yogis as being the highest. And it's practically understandable because you can see that work, knowledge, 
and various types of meditation are all subordinate to love. Love is the highest principle and love is the essence of the living entity's existence. So the one who actually worships Krishna in devotion, that is the mood of love. And therefore that is the highest expression of the living entity's uh, existence. And when it's directed towards the Supreme, it's the highest form of spiritual attainment. Because Krishna is attracted by love. He's not so much, he's not attracted by knowledge, by meditation, by austerities, by ceremonies. All these things don't attract Krishna. Krishna is attracted by love. Bhaktiyamam avijananti hiranyasyakmita. Only by devotion can I be known as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you understand the mysteries of my understanding. That's why some you know, these yogis, they, they criticize us. They say, oh, you guys are sentimentalists. You have all these, you know, you have these simple ladies that, who are wor worshiping and you're saying they're on the highest platform. But we understand that the gopis of Vrindavan were the highest form of, of worshipers because they knew only Krishna and they only wanted to please Krishna. They had attained pure knowledge in previous verse to, to attain that status of um, gopis in Vrindavan. But they were beyond knowledge anymore. There is, there is in the process of devotion, first there is cultivation of, of knowledge and then there's knowledge with devotion and then there's the highest platform is devotion that is devoid of all knowledge. In other words, that knowledge has become amalgamated into devotion itself. And that's the highest form of expression. That's the gopis and Vrindavan. So understand that love, everyone understands that love is the highest human sentiment and the most satisfying of all. When that's connected to Krishna, the yogis, the jnanis, they don't, they're not expressing love to Krishna. They're trying to get something from Krishna. They may be very elevated spiritually, but they fall short of Ananda. They miss out on Ananda. They have Sat, eternality. They have Chit, knowledge, but they don't have Ananda. And without Ananda, you can't maintain your platform. Whatever you achieve, Unless you come to the platform of love, everything remains incomplete. Mm -hmm. And that's where the devotees are. We're trying to love Krishna by serving mm -hmm. Krishna and to please Krishna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maharaj, I have a question. Is that okay? Can I ask? Yeah, yeah. Did you get uh, the first one? Uh, yes, yes, Maharaj, very detailed and thank you so much. I always have that confusion, like uh, I read so many times Yoga Ladder, but I always have that confusion like Jnana knowledge and uh, Ashtanga Yoga and Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, but it's uh, very clear and uh, mm, very detailed. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. I'll go back and I'll read again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Maharaj, I have one more question, like... Uh, um like having like you know coming to this krishna conscious i mean we are practicing this bhakti yoga but still like uh, we have the mix of uh, like you know uh, we still have like personal desires um you know personal goals and everything but we also have a desire we are doing chanting you're also doing like a deity worship and uh, uh, reading books so are we still considered like doing a bhakti yoga like, it's, it's, it's mixed. It's explained in both Bhagavad Gita and especially in Bhagavatam, the bhakti mixed with karma, bhakti mixed with jnana. Mm -hmm. like that. So that's there's a mixture. It's called karma mishra bhakta, bhakti mm -hmm. or jnana mishra bhakti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a mixture, that's all. Mm -hmm. But that means we, we are moving towards pure bhakti, but we still have these 
tendencies towards karma and jnana. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But if you stay in the process, gradually you you elevate yourself beyond these other personal desires. Okay. Because bhakti is so sweet, mm. and as you taste bhakti, you start losing your taste for every, everything else. Yes, mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. and yogis, they don't really get much happiness. They get a lot of, what we say, knowledge, and they get some satisfaction from the powers that they have achieved through their austerities. But ultimately, they're, they, they're devoid of that ananda mood. Thank you, Maharaj. So we have to continue right now. My bhakti is mixed. So we have to continue eventually, like by mercy of uh, uh, you and devotees' mercy. Definitely, I will. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Your association. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Is there any other last question maybe from anyone? It doesn't look like there are any other. Yeah, go on, Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru Raja and Radha here. All glories to Shia Prabhupada, all glories to your divine grace. Um, yes, um, I was thinking about um, devotee, pure devotees, um, uh, like Shia Prabhupada. He actually, I hear that he manifests some mystic um, powers, but he used in Krishna consciousness. I mean, he didn't want to um how to say but the uh, devotees they see it. i mean um sometimes they can see it and how power how power can be pure devotee but he um didn't um using use this like a miss this um yogis and um they they can use it but he just um sometimes they can see that he had these powers i just remember that yeah um yeah, many times they came out. Yeah, Prabhupada was very powerful. You could become you become powerful too as you make advancement in devotional service. But that power is not something you, that you devotees by nature are humble, but the power is coming from Krishna. The body doesn't get enchanted with the fact that I have some powers. He's just thinking whatever I have, it's coming from Krishna. So let me use it in Krishna's service. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Radha Vino Dini. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, you mentioned that uh, you did something with all those uh, lectures on the cloud. Are they still available? Uh, which, oh yeah. Uh, uh, it's that uh, Vivek Prabhu used to download those fro uh, the audio files to, to upload to SoundCloud. And I used to download to upload to, to YouTube the videos. So I did the downloading and, and it, uh, it was uploaded to YouTube. And uh, Vivek Prabhu at that time also started to download for, for, uh, for uploading to SoundCloud. So they none, are... None of the lectures are, have been deleted, have they? No, 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 no. It's just when we process them, then they can be uh, deleted from the from the cloud. Oh, so then you can find them in another place. Then that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. 
I don't think so. There are any other questions, Guru Maharaj? Okay. I have a I have a question, Guru Maharaj. Please, if I may. Uh, would you say that the addition of a yoga routine to our lives for health and for for exercise is that a good idea? What do you mean asanas? Yes, yoga asanas. Yeah, not yeah for health. Yeah. There's many things you can do for health, and that's one thing. But Prabhupada said, don't try to use this yoga for, you know, for spiritual adva advancement. It's bhakti yoga is the process of this. Age. Asanas are part of the astanga yoga process. It's one of the, it's the third stage of astanga yoga. But the best thing for health is pranayama. If you want to be healthy, it says that pranayama gives the maximum amount of health. Oh. So if you learn pranayama, you can increase the quality of your health tremendously. Okay. All right. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Bol, Hare Bol. Is there a time for another question? Yeah, Matsya. Yes, Prabhupada. Matsya Das uh, speaking. My humble obeisance is my age. So um, as I was uh, listening to your wonderful explanations, just one thing occurred, and I'm not sure where exactly is that. I think I'm pretty certain, actually, that it's um, somewhere in the first chapters of the third canto. One of the purports, if not more than one, uh, Srila Prabhupada emphasizes that a devotee is also Gyani. Well, it means he has not. Yeah, it means he has knowledge. Uh, my impression was that it's 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 even more than that. Yeah, well, uh, well, you can say that Gyan is included in Bhakti. That's what it, that's what it really means. Yes. Yeah, because the Fadanti tad tad vad vidyas tad gyat gyat avayam. Brahmati, Paramatmati, Bhagavaniti, Sabjate. The absolute truth is Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So those who are on the platform of Bhagavan and realizing that the principles of Bhagavan, that includes Gyan. That includes Gyan realization. Bhagavan realization includes uh, Brahman, Brahman realization and Bhagavan and Paramat realization. In Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna explains Buddha Yoga. And uh, he says, actually, the point is that Buddha Yoga includes um, all of the other yogas that are mentioned there. Yeah, well, Prabhupada said Buddha Yoga means Bhakti Yoga. <laughs> that's yes. Direct, yeah, that's what it means. It's just another term. Booty means it what it means knowledge in that sense. So the body has full knowledge also. Right, thank you. Does that answer your question? Um, I, uh, well, yes, yes, definitely does, but uh, I, I'm, I wish I'm uh, by my computer and then I can find this, uh, this purport and then um, um, throw the ball back to you and then uh, ask another sub question like that, but I, I just, I can't remember exactly what is said there. So then, yes, it satisfies my okay. question. Thank you. It talks about Gyan, you mean? Yes, yeah, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's, 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 it's quite clear that, you know, if you, on Brahma, on Bhagavan, 
level of practice, the other two are automatically included. Yes, but also that point from the Bhagavad Gita, Buddha Yoga, yes, that's Bhakti Yoga, but then um, what exactly is included in Buddha Yoga? It's also the, uh, the, the yoga, as, as, the, as you have mentioned, the pranayama and the postures and the sitting uh, uh, posture um, and the meditation and um, um, karma yoga as well and uh, uh, jnana yoga as well. So that all forms. So do your duty as karma yoga uh, with knowledge, meaning the um, uh, jnana yoga. In meditation means dhyana yoga. And then all, all that together forms buddhi yoga. So that was kind of the direction I, yeah. I thought to go into uh, with my question. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, and then that means that the vote is also dhyani. It was just my understanding from, from that purpose. I wish I could I can read it anyway. There's many verses in the Bhagavad Gita that illustrate the different yogas. Actually, at first I wanted to ask you when you said that Krishna accepts love uh, from his devotee, not austerity, nothing else, just the, uh, the love that devotee has. And that distinguishes the devotee from, from any other um, kind of um, existence, so to say. So I thought to ask you if you'd like to um, elaborate a little more about how this love manifests and how it can manifest. Love, love means to serve and love means to serve to please. If you, have, if you have some regard for someone or you're trying to show love for someone, you, you learn a little bit about them, you learn what, make, what makes them happy, and then you perform that activity with that desire to, to please them. That's, that's bhakti, that's love. You know, and, and Rupa Goswami explains it. Ayami, 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 yes, what is it? Ay, uh, what is that verse? Karma, ayami, anya, karma. What is that verse? I think the Bhakti Rupa Samhita Sindhu. Uh, anya Bilasita Sunyam? Yeah, any, Ayami Bilasita Sunyam, Gyana Karma, and Arbitam, Anukulena Krishna Silanam. Bhakti Uttama. So that that is the that is the definition of bhakti given by Rupa Goswami. And he shows what it isn't. It's not has doesn't have any fruit of activities or any desire for gain through philosophical speculation. It must be in relationship to Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. Now there are people who please Krishna but don't have the desire to please Krishna. You can please Krishna without having the desire to please Krishna, but that's not bhakti. Only when you have a desire to please Krishna does it actually come into the category of bhakti. For instance, the demons, they also please Krishna because Krishna likes to fight and so he has somebody to fight with, so he's pleased. But still, their intention is not to please him, so therefore they don't get bhakti, they get liberation. So yeah, bhakti is exclusive. That verse, if you get the definitions and the commentaries on that verse by Rupa Goswami, you get a clear understanding what is what is bhakti yoga. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, it's very simple. One who serves Krishna with a desire to please Krishna and to know what Krishna likes means to take shelter from his bona fide spiritual master to understand the activities that are, are recommended for serving Krishna. That sounds very simple. Where is the problem then? The problem is that people if you have, if you want to, if you want to point to your nose, you take your hand and then instead of going right to your nose, you go around your head and then catch your nose that way. Okay. 
that's how people think. It has to be complicated. It has to be hard to understand. But it means putting Krishna first. Everyone has desire, and so they want to fulfill their desire using Krishna as the object of their worship. And therefore, it's not real bhakti, it's mixed bhakti. So even Prabhupada says, even jnana has elements of bhakti in it. Even yoga has elements of bhakti in it. Even the karmis have elements of bhakti because they're, they're worshiping his external energy. But real bhakti is, is un, what is called ananya bhakti or pure bhakti. And Bhupa Goswami's definition is the perfection of that understanding. And Krishna says it throughout the Gita too. And Prabhupada says the essence of bhakti yoga comes in the verse 1865. Manmana bhava mad bhakto mam He says you do these four things, you're practicing bhakti yoga. Always think of me, become his devotee, worship him, and offer your homage to him. These four things make up the whole process of bhakti yoga. But it, within those four categories, there are a lot of subcategories. If you're thinking of Krishna in order to become Krishna, that's not yoga. <laughs> Can we think of Krishna in order to become like Krishna? Um, we can't become like Krishna because he's unique. There's no one like him. But you can you you have the same qualities of him. So the likeness is terms of qualities and not quantity. Quantity is he is the quanti, he's the quantitative principle of all qualities. We have his qualities in minute quantity, but not all of those qualities either, only a percentage of those qualities. As is explained in Nectar of Devotion, we have 78% of the qualities of the Supreme. So if we can perfect those 78%, then we have developed all pure spiritual qualities. So we know when we can't become no one can become as great as Krishna. It's not. There's, there's that verse. Uh, what is that verse? Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitananam eko bahonam vidadati kamam. He is the one eternal that maintains all the other eternals. No one is equal to, and no one is greater than him. He, he's in he's in the platform of it. He is he's in his own category. <laughs> but Prabhupada said you can become almost like Krishna. <laughs> when did he say that? I, uh, I just heard it just a couple of days ago in Prabhupada's lecture. He said you can become almost as good as Krishna. <laughs> That's encouraging. Because we're we have the same same nature as he has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like as a grihasta wannabe in a male body, I feel like I need to become almost like him <laughs> in order to um, to be what I'm supposed to be. Well, we can always become better than what we are, that's for sure. <laughs> and that's what that's what bhakti is, increasing the quality of our increasing the increasing our qualities, increasing the quantities of our qualities.
there's no limit how much you can grow in spiritual life. But then when you grow to a certain level of perfection, you won't, you can't stay in this world anymore. You know, you know, you just, the capacity to live in this world anymore is, is destroyed by your, your perfection in bhakti. And then at that point, you go back to the spiritual world. You get COVID. <laughs> well, sometimes Krishna will use something material to bring you back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see devotees die in different material ways, just like Harmi's die. But that's, that's arranged by Krishna just to bring them back. But their death is not like the death of the non-devotees. When they die, they instantly leave their body and they, they're immediately back in the spiritual world. There's no time calculation from the time they leave to the time they return. The more sinful you are, the longer it takes for you to get your next body. The more pious and religious you are, the faster it comes. When you're a pure devotee, it says that mm, to, give a, to give a material description, it's like a flashing of lightning and thunder. It's like that fast. You're now in the material world. The light, lightning flashes and now you're back in the spiritual world that fast. But that's for the pure devotees. Mm -hmm. But we all have capacity to become pure. That's our, our nature is pure anyway. We are pure by nature. So pure revealing purity means getting rid of the contamination and so on. And the more you engage in devotional service, the more you can uh, see how contaminated you are. And then we get to finer, finer, and finer forms of material, subtle contaminations that we don't even recognize. It's so subtle, our material contaminations that only as we're making advancement do we start to see them. Yeah, so looking in, in the mirror is relevant from day one to until yeah. the end. Yeah, taking inventory, we call it. <laughs> yeah. Ashla Prabhupada wrote in um, um, the Krishna Consciousness Topmost Yoga System that uh, um, how does he write exactly? Uh, the science of self-realization. Self no, oh, I can't remember. It begins by by um, looking at the things which we are accustomed to see every day. It's not exact quote, but it's pretty close. So self-realization begins by by um, examining the things which we are accustomed to see every day uh, i can find it exactly how it's how yeah it's it makes sense um, as you, every day means each time you observe it you see it either more or less slightly different yes Knowledge is a, a factor of spiritual advancement. And so as knowledge awakens, realization awakens. Hare Krishna. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you. Hare Krishna. I think Guru Maharaj, uh, we can
can end the session now. You're in charge. <laughs> Maybe, yes, we can end the session now. Thank you so much for the wonderful session, Guru Maharaj. It was really nice to hear, the, especially I like when, when you said that Krishna is only looking for love. So that's that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. That if you want to attract Krishna, that's that's how it, that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Chai. Okay. Thank you. Vanchikal Pataru Pesha Kripa Sindhu Vev Cha Patita Nam Pamne Pyo Vaishnav Pyo Namo Namah Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Guru Dev Ki Jai Anand Koti Vaishnav Rindra Ki Jai 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 Hari 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 Bo Hari Bo Thank you very much Thank you Guru Maharaj Thank you Guru Maharaj Hari Krishna Hari Krishna Guru Maharaj Thank you very much Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you. Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Namrata, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, 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 Hare Krishna. Hare Hey, welcome. My humble obeisance. How's the weather in North Carolina? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, getting warmer. It's nice. It's nice weather here. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Are you going to? The, are you going to? The, are you having programs anywhere? Yeah, not here in the temple. Mostly in the temple, uh, not uh, in the local. Yes. So, uh, okay. Hare Krishna. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Maharaj. Are you in the room that I used uh, to stay here. in? Uh, just below, just below. Here I work. <laughs> below where I used to stay. <laughs> so, uh, really, you're, you're, you're downstairs. You're downstairs, huh? Yeah, I'm downstairs, yes. <laughs> Okay. Let's see what I see. My respects to Hare Hare Krishna. Yeah, sure, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. <laughs>